Well, first, let me take this opportunity to express my deep gratitude to Wycliffe um, and to Thornlow for the honor of this invitation, um, particularly to the Andrewses for having me to stay in their home and offering me such warm hospitality, and to members of the Wycliffe fac faculty, especially um, Ephraim Radner and Joe Mangina for their um, uh, conversation and welcome. And of course, to, to Mark and to his president, uh, Robert Derenbacher, um, for um, making this possible. And Steve Hugo for doing all the practical details on which he's absolutely brilliant. I'm deeply grateful to you all. Then, by way of brief explanation of what follows in today's lecture, I am currently writing volumes two and three of my systematic theology together because they are on Sin, volume two, and Salvation, volume three. And together, of course, they're on theological anthropology more generally. Um, and there will indeed be a long and complex chapter in volume two on Genesis three and its interpretation on this deep mystery of what sin is. If you think at the start of this hour that you know what sin is, I hope you'll become deeply confused um, in a few moments. Um, but what I'm offering you today is um, a more philosophical, you might say more apologetic spin-off from that project, because it's me in my analytic philosophy of religion persona um, to the fore, or rather in my role as an exemplar of a new movement that you may know of called analytic theology, um, which was started by Crisp and Ray in a book of that name, which is on your handout, um, whose members uh, subscribe to being analytic philosophers of religion, but wish to bring that discourse into much deeper and more richly um, integrative um, coherence with biblical exegesis and classical Christian thought. Um, and the view is that by doing so, it will be able to be possible to probe more deeply and richly the philosophical problems that actually emerge um, ultimately from scripture. So I'm, being, uh, I'm wearing a hat that you may not be expecting, but this is me in my more analytic philosophy of religion, analytic theology voice. So my, the rest of this lecture is going to proceed in three dialectical parts in which my goal is to complexify, enrich, and to some extent disturb the ways the topic of sin is currently approached specifically in the analytic philosophical discourse. In particular, I'm interested in the relationship between sin and desire in the original biblical narrative, something I believe fundamental to its structure and a matter on which a number of classic Jewish and Christian authors are particularly interesting. Yet desire is a topic in which analytic philosophy has only recently evidenced some new fascination after long neglect. And the new convergence of interest on this theme may be revealing and fortuitous for our purposes, as I shall comment along the way, and particularly in closing. In the first substantive part of the lecture then, that's actually section two on your handout, I'm going to do my exegetical work first by returning to some of the mysterious dimensions of the account of the origins of sin in Genesis 3. This undertaking will, to say the least, complicate the philosophical task of clarifying the nature of sin beyond what is usually assumed in the current philosophical literature. And please note that I'm not assuming any fundamentalist commitments in thus turning back to the biblical text, but rather seeking to probe afresh the original nexus from which a remarkable variety of classic renditions took off. In the West, we are so steeped in Augustine that we almost take him for granted, but you're going to hear about some very different renditions. And here, indeed, we shall not find any immediate answer to our philosophical questions, but rather a case of what the anthropologist Levi Strauss would have called the characteristically mythical mediation of unbearable contradictions in a narrative which irreducibly holds and yet also generates a plethora of further philosophical puzzles. That's what Levi Strauss meant by a myth, not something that's not true, but something that characteristically mediates what he calls impossible or unbearable contradictions. 
In particular, what is sin exactly? What is its relation to human desire and human freedom? Why and how is evil already in the world at all in the person of the serpent in the story? And why have Adam and Eve been given the particular prohibition that is presented to them? In other words, what seems to be an explanation of sin and evil in Genesis 3 is in fact a narrative generator of further philosophical problems, or aporiae. That is the very nature of its particular mythic narrative, and it is important first to acknowledge and understand that rather than resist it. In the next section, section three, I shall wear my historical theologian's hat and reflect on how certain early rabbinic and Christian responses to the problem of sin diverge dramatically in their resolution of these narrative problems. I shall choose to identify only three Christian strands of such interpretation in a rough typology, but each strand, as we shall see, generates a further theodicy issue and a further set of philosophical problems. It just gets worse. The lesson to be learnt here is that there seems to remain in any rich theological interpretation of the narrative of Genesis 3 a profound element of divine mystery even alongside the various dimensions of philosophical unsatisfactoriness which may seem to attend it. But in the last section, four, I shall propose one possible philosophical solution to the difficulties, one that draws somewhat eclectically on the classic materials we have surveyed. And my aim here is to throw particular contemporary light on the relation of desire, temptation, freedom, and sin, and therefore to construct a Felix Culpa rendition of the fall beyond and complementary to the famous Christological one known in the West from the time of Augustine, that the good thing about the fall, the happy fault, was that it led to salvation in Christ. And I'm going to dub this a double Felix Culpa alternative which involves the retrieval of an important strand in Anselm's thinking, not from his famous Cur Deus Homo, but from his rather neglected little text On the Fall of the Devil, De Caso Diabolus, conjoined with some passing but rich insights from the East Syrian traditions on Genesis 3. For me, this amalgam will constitute the best possible philosophical rendition of Genesis 3 that attends sensitively to its crucial philosophical detail, de, uh, problems, and in particular, its key focus on the relation between desire and sin, yet without reducing the final mystery of divine providence inherent in the narrative. So that's the structure of what's to come. Let me now comment just briefly to complete the work of this introductory section on what analytic philosophy of religion has to date tended to say when confronting the problem of sin and the fall. For it's precisely this that I seek to complexify and enrich. What we find here, I submit, is not any unanimous witness as such, except insofar as there is a tendency to rush quickly to the familiar difficulties of the modern problem of evil and its potential solution according to some version of the so-called free will defense or a variation on it, and thus not to tarry as long as would be desirable with the demanding and puzzling questions of what actually constitutes sin according to the biblical narrative. A fine programmatic article by the late Philip Quinn, Sin and Original Sin, may be seen as indicative of these tendencies in analytic philosophy of religion. It wastes no time in providing a definition of sin as, quote, the concept of a human fault that offends a morally perfect God and brings with it guilt. That's his definition of sin. A human fault that offends God and brings guilt. And he does this, this definition, in complete abstraction from the complications of the biblical narrative. He then moves fast to the Western Augustinian understanding of original sin and immediately declares it morally problematic from the perspective of modern Western sensibilities. John Locke, Immanuel Kant, Soren Kierkegaard, or more recently, Richard Swinburne. 
The doctrine of original guilt is declared even more unacceptable. I quote, we are guilty only for our own morally evil actions, individualistically, and so we acquire guilt only by committing personal sins, close quote. Quinn's article thus throws down the gauntlet from which other analytic philosophers of religion seem to scatter in various directions, albeit with a shared presumption that individualist libertarian freedom of some sort must be defended to the hilt. Thus, Richard Swinburne's account of sin in his book Responsibility and Atonement, chapter 9, which preceded Quinn's article and is already commented on by, by him, takes a strong line against Augustinian original sin, largely because it abrogates what Swinburne already presumes as a supreme good, the human power for incompatibilist freedom, necessary as a first plank in any free will defense, as we know from Swinburne's other writings on the problem of evil. Thus, Augustine is repudiated to core. I quote Swinburne, there seems no reason whatever to adopt, adopt the Augustinian view. That's because he's already decided what freedom is. And Swinburne correlatively throws in his lot with what he calls, quote, the liberal Greek-speaking theologians of the early centuries, close quote, whom he takes, we shall shortly see if this is correct, it isn't actually, as propounding some form of modern incompatibilism, i.e. the human power individualistically to determine our own destiny, as he puts it. In a form of radical human aseity, significantly diremped from the transcendent causal powers of the divine. To be sure, Swinburne is alert to modern evolutionary thinking in this mix, and hence does have something to say about desire, not, however, inspired directly by the biblical text. He thinks desire is passive, rather oddly, but selfish, and delivered to us by our evolutionary inheritance. This, however, despite being a complicating and countervailing factor, has no need to disturb the heroic capacity for individual free will in Homo sapiens. And sin, in contrast, is simply, for Swinburne, quote, a failure in a duty to God, close quote, considered juridically, and again, without any direct reference to the biblical text. We might see Michael Ray's long recent article, The Metaphysics of Original Sin, in dialectical contrast, as a sort of extended, albeit implicit, riposte to Swinburne's presumptions about the fall and as setting the gold standard for a sophisticated metaphysical defense of Augustinian original sin as precisely compatible with the principle Ray calls MR, moral responsibility. That is, I quote, a person P is morally responsible for the obtaining of a state of affairs S only if S obtains or obtained and P could have prevented S from obtaining, close quote. I'm not going to repeat the details of Ray's complex argument here, except to note that he provides two different possible metaphysical pictures, neither wildly popular, as he says, in current philosophical circles, for rendering moral responsibility and the doctrine of original sin, DOS, logically compatible with one another. This is a heroic achievement in its own terms, and if you're a Calvinist here, or even more generally an Augustinian, and you want to be an analytic philosopher as well, this might be the article that could help you. But again, we notice that a supreme good that is assumed to be in need of defense is a particular kind of modern rendition of moral responsibility, one that has supreme significance in the arena of the free will defense. Sin is not actually defined in reference to the biblical text again, or indeed at all, except in its, quote, original form as a, quote, kind of corruption that disposes us to it. Finally, from the analytic circles, and very differently again, one might think of the late Marilyn Adams' renowned attempt in her book Christ and Horrors, her attempt to give an account of the creation and fall as representing a problem of vulnerable embodiment rather than primarily a problem of sin or human error as such. What Adams chooses to call human non-optimality, I find that a wonderful way of talking about um, our condition of frailty, 
resides in our embodied state, our necessary subjection to what Adams calls horrors, events such as would make any particular life not worth living. On this perspective, Augustine's rendition of the fall's meaning is certainly false. And, quote, even if Adam's and Eve's choices are supposed to be somehow self-determined, I quote, God is responsible for creating human beings into such a framework. So she doesn't let God off the hook. Adams' account of the basic theodicy problem is thus obviously different again from Swinburne's and Ray's, and we shall shortly investigate if it, too, has any base in classic patristic theorizations of the fall. But the point here, once again, is that some version of the modern problem of evil is again the tail wagging the philosophical dog in these accounts of sin. Adam intensifies this problem still further under the category of horror and in a somewhat heterodox fashion in which vulnerable bodiliness constitutes the main problem to be negotiated, not primarily sin as such. But what her account of the fall ironically shares with both Swinburne and Ray is a presumption that, quote, the modern problem of evil is the fundamental issue to be negotiated in and behind any story of the fall and the origins of human error or depravity. Now that's just a little survey of what's happening in analytic philosophy of religion on sin. And I think you can already see there are some problems. <laughs> so let us move now to section two and see if there is any mandate for the presumptions made by this group of very uh, sophisticated analytic philosophers. And now, of course, we must turn back to the bib biblical text itself and see what we can possibly make of it. So here's Genesis 3 to 4 and its paradoxes. What is sin and the relation to desire in the biblical text? What I shall be arguing here is that an analytic philosopher who wishes to be a good theologian, an analytic theologian, needs, in contrast to these existing discussions in analytic philosophy of religion, sophisticated as they are, to turn back first more probingly to the very mystery of sin as presented in the biblical text and its intrinsic connection to the category of desire, a theme which Indeed, along with sin, the analytic tradition of philosophy has to a large degree neglected to probe with any great exactitude, at least until recently. Now, I don't call sin a mystery unthinkingly here, because the first and central message of this paper is to urge that the story of the fall in Genesis 3 presents us with no unambiguous account of what sin at its root is. So I urge you in the course of this hour to reflect afresh on whether you think you know what it is. But it's rather a narrative that acts as a kind of koan, the presentation of a set of irreducible paradoxes which must and should continue to tease our philosophical minds. In putting things that way, I acknowledge once more my indebtedness to modern theorists of myth who have pointed to the irreducible structures of such myths for human meaning-making. While structuralism as a whole, say, explanatory project is now deeply unfashionable in anthropology, some of the insights that Claude Levi-Strauss brought to the study of myth remain, as already intimated above, hugely insightful in my view, and by no means need to be read as implying that myths signal untruthfulness. On the contrary, I think they express particular truths better than they could be expressed in any other way. As Adrian Cunningham discussed long ago in a little book which still repays study, Levi Strauss's proposal that culturally sustaining myths are those that mediate contradictions in narrative form is of considerable significance for theological reflection in general and has special bearing on the full narrative in particular, as I shall now attempt to show in what follows. The biblical story presents to us different and conflicting truths which appear unassailable to us and yet have to coexist in some kind of seemingly unbearable tension. What is clear from the Genesis text, however, is that sin is inexorably something to do with desire gone wrong. Although the mystery starts already in Genesis 2.17, 
with a strange and unexplained prohibition from Yahweh not to eat from a particular tree under pain of death. And it is this point about the vicissitudes of desire that I now wish to explore hermeneutically. What we should note first in returning to Genesis 3 for a moment, unfettered if we can by later Western presumptions, is that desire features even more significantly in the Hebrew text than our modern translations tend to pick up. And early Jewish interpreters were very attuned to those interesting um, semantic complexities. Thus, in Genesis 3, 6, in which Eve's initial temptation by the serpent is described, two words for desire are used in quick succession. I quote, So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight, literally in Hebrew, a desirable thing, ta'awa, to the eyes, and was to be desired, another Hebrew verb, nechma, to make one wise, she took of the fruit and ate. The particular impossible contradiction inscribed here, it seems to me, is that the human capacity for such desire at this stage in the story points simultaneously in two opposing directions. It is clearly already a striking feature of the human made in the image of God to have the capacity for such desire. So Adam and Eve are already desiring creatures. And indeed, the further activation of that desire is clearly, strictly speaking, required for the human more fully to come into that image if the human is to know good and evil and thereby acquire the godlike capacity for wisdom and discernment. Thus, in an important sense, desire is the mark of the paradoxical necessity of the fall, the felix culpa of which Augustine was later to speak so tellingly, and which other Western authors such as Anselm further ramified in ways we shall discuss below. In this sense too, although Eve has in one strand of Christian tradition, in 1 Timothy 2 and later in Tertullian, who says, you are the devil's gateway, already been marked out for particular projective blame, and there are intimations of that in early Jewish literature as well, her striking initiative she takes the initiative here, is also, from another perspective, her distinctive desiring contribution to the necessary drama of salvation. Once the fall has occurred, however, a new sort of gender binary becomes fatally fixed. Woman to painful childbearing, man to endless toil. And Eve's desire is now characterized by a different and third word in Genesis 3.16, Teshuka, which appears only three times in the Hebrew Bible and seemingly connotes, although this is heavily disputed in the secondary literature and also bemused some of the early translations, including the Peshitta translation and the Septuagint translation, but it seems to connote a kind of obsessive sexual desire for a man, which is then met with a yet deeper demand by him for subjection. I've cited a very important article by Andrew McIntosh on the meaning of Teshuka, which is the latest review of all the immense, immensely complicated literature on this subject, on which Bishop Andrews also um, commented extremely insightfully in his Cambridge dissertation. I've been sitting up at night in bed reading his Cambridge dissertation, which isn't published, and uh, I commend it to you. It is surely not insignificant that this same word, teshuka, is used almost immediately once more in Genesis 4, 7, where the text rather curiously says of Cain's jealousy for his brother that sin is lurking at the door. Its desire, teshuka, is for you, but you must master it. Note that this false desiring inherent in sibling rivalry and violence in Genesis 4, is not the original sin, as some followers of René Girard would have it, but it's a secondary spin-off, one linguistically coterminous with Eve's corrupted sexual desire. So there's something about this word that relates both to sex and somehow to either violence or jealousy. 
In other words, it's corrupted or misdirected desire of some sort that is the special mark of sin, along with the disobedience to divine instruction that then follows. But not original desire itself, which in its uncorrupted form appears to have a special role in propulsion towards the divine, propulsion to consideration of the goods of the earth, and even propulsion towards a certain likeness to God. As a later minority report in the rabbinical tradition also put it, it's actually from the Jerusalem Talmud, speaking of the mysterious Yetzer Hara, the evil inclination, which was used by the evil early rabbis to further explain the mysterious original propulsion to sin in Genesis 3, I'm quoting now from the Jerusalem Talmud, it is obvious that we have no strength to resist it, the evil inclination, so let it be your will, Lord my God, that you vanquish it from before us and subdue it, so that we may do your will as our own will with a whole heart. I think it's instructive here to find such a remarkable parallel to later Western Augustinian sensibilities. It would seem then that the nature of Eve's sin of disobedience, or more deeply as I see it, corrupted desire, is also and paradoxically her particular felix culpa, characterized by a desire that reaches out of and beyond itself, that is, precisely stretches out to God. Whereas the unambiguous sin seems to be desire wrongly aimed, desire missing its mark, or rather misaggregated in its attempt to grasp and control what is more appropriately weighted on as a gift. In other words, it is good, surely, that she desires to discern good and evil. It is wrong that she takes it for herself. And then that becomes corrupted into some kind of obsessive sexual subservience, or as in Cain's case, into jealousy or violence or projective blaming. When we finally ask then on this vision, who was to blame for the fall? The answer is, of course, from the perspective of mythic contradictions, hugely ambiguous. It was the serpent, it was Eve, it was Adam. All of these are possible. And in the early rabbinic commentaries, you get the emphasis on all three. And yet underlyingly, what the early rabbis are not willing to say, surely it must ultimately have been God in God's self who is responsible for the entire scenario. Yet the same God also behaves inscrutably by demanding an apparent, unthinking obedience to his command while placing before Adam and Eve a potential good of enormous significance, that is, the mature capacity for the discernment of good and evil, which it is indeed to become their due inheritance as made in the image of the divine in due course. Moreover, it seems from this story in the Hebrew that the fruit of the tree is indeed desirable. It is good to eat, as clarified by use of the Hebrew terms, and not merely apparently so, as some embarrassed patristic authors such as Gregory of Nyssa were later to aver. Further, while the story purports to explain the entry of sin into the world, it is clear that it is already there, at least potentially, in the form of the strange talking serpent, who himself also, after all, can only finally be the creation of the good creator. Whilst rabbinic tradition was to counter-explain this third in terms of the yetzer hara, the evil inclination, sometimes associating that particularly with the serpent, Christianity, quickly by the third century, had to reach for its own counter-myth, also founded in uh, proto-rabbinic thinking about uh, Genesis 6, in terms of the prior fall of the bad angels. Um, and that comes out of the Enochian literature um, and ultimately, as I said, Genesis 6. So there's a backing up. How can we explain that the serpent is there already? How can we explain that there's already an evil inclination? Answer, it must be because there was a fall of angels already. Finally and lastly, the threat of death stated as punishment for the sin of eating from the tree in the text is, of course, not actually carried out, at least not immediately, nor is it obvious that Adam and Eve would have been immortal if they had not eaten of it, since that possibility then becomes a further reason for expelling them from the garden. See Genesis 3.22. In short, 
What we might call the theodicy problems spawned by the text of Genesis 3 are at least as extensive and troubling as those which it purports to resolve. As in any just-so story or Levi-Straussian myth, the text generates yet more irresolvable questions, just as it seems to seek to provide an answer to them. But it has been precisely the burden of this section of the paper to insist that the holding of these unbearable contradictions together is what is irreducibly distinctive about this founding narrative on the origins of human sin in Genesis 3. And this, I should admit, should not be an offense to our philosophical and theological minds, but rather an enrichment and challenge to them. So now, having confused you thus far, I want to turn to a rough typology of classic Christian patristic and scholastic responses to the Genesis narrative. As we shall see, their interpretations, unlike their modern analytic philosophical counterparts, did keep the problem of corrupted or voluble desire at the heart of the picture in a variety of ways. Rather than merely reducing sin to a failure in duty, as in Swinburne, or an offense to a morally perfect God, Quinn, or in some kind of replacement of sin with um, physical vulnerability, as in Adam's. None of these definitions look convincing, frankly, in the light of the text. But as for the divergent classic interpretations which I shall now survey, the irony is that they were merely each of them in turn to spawn another set of paradoxes, mysteries, and theodicy problems. So it's a game of snakes and ladders. We are going up and down. Let me now illustrate this point by sketching three very different classic renditions of Genesis 3 and its narrative. So here, the plot thickens. Generating a typology of classic interpretations of the fall. Elaine Pagel's now classic treatment of the history of thinking about Genesis in the first four to five centuries CE, Adam, Eve, and the Serpent, draws a perhaps oversimplistic conclusion from her own complex account, which nonetheless still has some truth, though we're going to need to correct and modify it in what follows. I quote her. For nearly the first 400 years of our era, she writes, Christians regarded freedom as the primary meaning of Genesis 1 to 3 and self-mastery as the source of that freedom. So you can tell the story about how we needed to have freedom. With Augustine, she says, the message changed completely. Now the fall becomes a story of complete human bondage. Why was this? According to Pagels, it was largely the result of the Constantinian settlement such that after it, Christians had to reconceive their identity as non-martyrs in state terms, thus forcing conflict inside them. But I'm not sure that this explanation helps to explain the notable divergences of, for instance, the near contemporaries Gregory of Nyssa in the East and Augustine in the West on the fall. After all, both of these are post-Constantinian, or the general and continuing divergence of East and West on some crucial issues in understanding human freedom and human sinfulness. Moreover, as we shall now expound, there was also a third, admittedly minority report on the matter from a strand of theological reflection beyond the borders of the Roman Empire amongst the East Syrian, Syriac speaking, faithful followers of the theological traditions of Theodore of Mopsuestia. So let's look at these three in turn. First, Gregory of Nyssa. I call this embodied freedom tested. As you may know, Nyssen in his text, The Making of Man, reads Genesis 1 to 3 through a particular rendition of Genesis 1.27 broken into two parts. Genesis 1.27, in the image of God, God created the human. Male and female, he created them. Nissen reads this as saying that the initial creation of the human in the image is sort of humanoid or even angeloid. While what we would now call the boundary binary of gender comes into being only with an eye to the fall, en route to the fall. And ultimately, according to Gregory, that will be transcended once more at the end of time. So gender doesn't go through us all the way down. It doesn't have either 
protological or eschatological instantiation. By the same token, what constitutes the image of God in the human is essentially for Gregory intellectual or psychic, not in any way bodily or changeable. And unlike Athanasius before him, Gregory does not here press to insist immediately on the image's Christological form, ultimately, given the seriousness of the fall to come. As for the nature of the first sin and its explanation, Gregory is somewhat evasive in the making of man. He expatiates at some length on how the, quote, fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil evidences mixture or mixed knowledge in the beguiling sense. He thinks the fruit combines a divine good under the color and shape of that which stands for sensuality. And, quote, for this reason, writes Gregory, comes that desire which arises towards evil as though towards good. So he's facing here the problem that it was a good that Eve was reaching out for, but he thinks the covering of it was, connotes sensuality of a negative form. Again, it seems here as if the physical, or at any rate the sensual or passionate realm, is the prime problematic. And you might say there are shades of Marilyn Adams' revulsion against the physical here. But in Gregory, it's not a worry about the vulnerability of the body, but what he calls its heaviness, the physicality of us weighs us downwards. However, in his text, The Catechet Catechetical Oration, in contrast, Gregory looks at this issue from rather a different direction. Instead of explaining the act of the fall in terms of mingled sensuality and goodness, as if the body and sensuality were primarily to blame as a downward tug, he points instead directly to an evil which, in some way, he does not explain, attempt to explain it, arises from within us. I quote, it has its origin in the will, he says, when the soul withdraws from the good. But why and how does this happen? At one point, Gregory does indeed seem to start to advance what moderns would detect as a version of the free will defense. I quote him. Since it is the mark of free will to choose independently what it wants, says Gregory, God is not the cause of your present woes, for he made your nature independent and free. That's where Swinburne gloms onto uh, Gregory of Nyssa here. In short, the full narrative is more an indication of the risks of freedom than a collapse towards sensuality, let alone a tragedy of irreparable depravity, as in Augustine. And the serpent's rather strange role in the story for Gregory is that of evidencing a primary sin of envy. For, for, for Nissen, envy is the main problem. It's the primary sin. He took it amiss, the serpent, that there should be produced a being to resemble so closely the transcendent dignity of God, close quote. Overall, however, although the image of God in the human is not completely or disastrously marred as a result of the fall, according to Gregory, since our capacity for synergistic freedom endures, we can cooperate with God in freedom. Nonetheless, the sin is an enduring and distressing feature of post-lapsarian life, and our bodies are destined for death as a result of the fall. Complete restoration to participation in God and the renewal of good and indeed ecstatic desire for the divine life, for which Gregory's later commentary work is justly famed as a theme, come only through the power of the resurrection. It's important to note, however, that Gregory's account of synergistic human freedom, and this counts against Swinburne's inclination to treat him as a modern incompatibilist, involves a true cooperation between divine grace and human response. Werner Harrison's excellent monograph spells this exegetical point out with care. And thus, the fall cannot, in fact, involve an autonomous human aseity altogether direct from God's sustaining action. So Gregory is no modern libertarian. Thus, as Richard Norris showed in one of his last and most brilliant articles on Gregory's understanding of sin and the fall in his late works, the homilies on the Song of Songs, Gregory actually continues to tie himself into knots about the origins of evil and sin right up to the end of his life. And indeed, he apparently seems to make them worse. He still says that evil, which he takes with the majority tradition of early Christian thought to be insubstantial in comparison with the good, to be the result of the fruit's seductive mingling of opposites, sensuous and psychic. 
But now he admits that in effect, there is good even in this evil. The fruit is an apparent good and thus an occasion for teaching us something, he says. Further, and even more intriguingly, Gregory now argues concomitantly, and I believe he is the only exponent in the tradition to propose this, that the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and the tree of life are actually the same tree seen from different perspectives, since only one tree can stand right at the center of the garden, he insists. Such, then, is the paradoxical but close contiguity of good and evil at the heart of human desire. Ultimately, however, Gregory seems defeated by his own conundrum here. As Norris puts it, the symbolic and allegorical intersection of the two trees precisely illustrates Gregory's, I quote, fruitless struggle with the question of the origin of evil. That's Norris. Since he takes it as a red that human desire is basically and originally oriented to the good, the introduction of the idea of an intrinsic magnetism to evil finally flaws him as to its explanation, except insofar as the seductive fruit represents a downward tug to sensuality and materiality dressed up in its opposite. So the theodicy problem ultimately remain, remains and arguably is intensified. The good God is ultimately responsible for the temptation of the fall, and the good God is responsible likewise for making a seductive fruit appear desirable. And the freedom that Adam and Eve exercise in being seduced by the fruit does not in any incompatibilist way excuse them from the sustaining responsibility and providence of the divine. Finally flawed, Gregory has to admit at one point that the paradox of the two trees means that in a sense, good and evil are the same thing. Now this is a desperate ending point signaling Gregory's final bafflement at the ambiguity of human desire and its divine origins. So much for Gregory. You know, he's my hero, but he does seem to be in trouble here. Secondly, pedagogy and the adolescent human. This is a strand of tradition you may not know of, particularly in Theodore of Mopsuestia and Cyrus of Edessa. In another strand of Eastern thinking about the fall, which was to be promulgated later across the imperial border into Persia, however, an alternative rendition of the fall story was being concocted, which focused precisely on what Gregory would only hint at, viz. the idea that the ambiguous stretching of desire in the act of temptation was precisely intended to teach Adam and Eve something. This is a little known alternative to the Christian rendition of the fall, although it has a certain anticipation in Irenaeus's earlier suggestion in the West that Adam and Eve were adolescents rather than mature adults, hence their resistance to orders. And it stands in the thought of, the of Theodore of Mopsiesta himself, strangely alongside another account, which is much closer to that of the Cappadocians. Since we are partly reliant on later and fragmented texts from the sixth century Cyrus of Edessa for this unusual line of reflection, I here follow the Jesuit William Macomber's account of what Theodore's and Cyrus's second so-called pedagogical rendition of sin and the Genesis narrative amounts to. The argument runs thus, to put it succinctly and in Macomber's words. I quote, Whereas the traditional Eastern view begins with an initial happy state that is disrupted by sin and deteriorates progressively with time, this alternative rendition of Theodore's and Cyrus's begins with a state of radical imperfection that improves under divine action with the passing of the age towards better things. In this conception, man, though ultimately destined to attain a state of immortality and sinlessness, could not have been created thus in the beginning because he would have been incapable of appreciating this inestimable gift and of giving due thanks to God for it. For whereas God alone knows by his essence created natures by, by, by intrinsic, sorry, but, but for whereas God alone knows by his essence created natures by sinfulness, by intrinsic necessity can only learn by contraries. And hence, without an experience of sinfulness and death, they could never learn to understand and appreciate sinlessness and immortality. Indeed, if we had been created immortal and immutable from the beginning, 
we would have been no better off than a pearl of comely beauty that is unaware of its own splendor and is not conscious whether it is fixed in the crown of a king or whether, likewise, it is set in a camel's saddle, as Cyrus puts it. And hence, we would have derived no profit from these priceless gifts. Thus, in Cyrus's view, whatever gifts Adam may or may not have received in the beginning, he was radically imperfect because he lacked the capacity to appreciate and benefit from the most important of the gifts that God intended ultimately to bestow on him, whenever he knew would be the best and man would be able to receive them. So the school of Theodore thus developed this pedagogic theodicy with remarkable acuity and originality. Simply, however, and bemusically, setting this account alongside their other and opposite rendition, rather as the rabbis also allowed the colligation of contemporary interpretations in their distinctive contestation of meaning on Genesis. So it's a rather interesting pedagogic hermeneutic you set down com two completely different renditions of a text and allow people to worry about it. But we do not find evidences of the pedagogic model being developed in any sustained and philosophic form in this tradition. Moreover, while the suggestion of this minority pedagogic strand apparently solved one central theodicy problem, the divine permission for the existence of evil, it by no means dispelled others. Did God want Adam and Eve to sin then, or only to be tempted? How was this a higher order good, exactly, if and when they did sin, and so unleash the consequences on the world? How could that then lead to a confidence in their final perfection, and so on? I'm going to come back to these questions very shortly, in the form of Anselm's closer philosophical treatment of them. But meanwhile, we turn thirdly and very briefly to Augustine, whose rendition could scarcely be more different from Cyrus's. Here is no pedagogy of ascent from adolescence to maturity, but a dramatic and eradicable descent into erotic enslavement. So thirdly, original sin in Adam. We're on more familiar territory here. Augustine's vision of the effects of the fall are, of course, also notably contrastive with Gregory of Nyssa's. And not the least interesting feature of this divergence is the picture of gender that is a crucial part of them both. Unlike many contemporary feminist commentators, commentators I am disinclined simply to besmirch Augustine for his various renditions of the binary of gender, which have complex and rich features, not in any case wholly consistent between the differing accounts he gives in his various texts, the literal commentary on Genesis, the good of marriage, the De Trinitate, and the city of God. And in more than one of these texts, he shows a considerable interest in protecting women from male violence and violation. I do an account of this in chapter six of God's sexuality and the self. Yet there is no doubt that Augustine's interpretation of Genesis two and three, which is solely his own, has had unparalleledly ambiguous implications for women down the centuries in the Christian West. And this is integral to his theory of the fall and desire, not a mere coincidental accompaniment. The most important point for our current purposes here is that unlike Gregory, Augustine holds that distinctively different maleness and femaleness, the female subordinate to the male, are intrinsic parts of the original unfallen state of the human, as too is enacted sexuality, which is nonetheless wholly good insofar as it is rationally conducted and procreatively fruitful. That's in City of God 14. What goes wrong in the fall, therefore, is a new sort of servitude or subordination of woman to man as a result of it. Even though she was already pre-fall, appropriately subject to her husband, Augustine avers, yet now, quote, there is a condition similar to that of slavery rather than the bond of love. So that subjection is a result of the fall. This is subjection gone completely awry. See his literal commentary on this. And note that this involves close and accurate attention to the reflections on desire in the biblical text as outlined above. Yet seemingly the subjection occurred because Eve was on her own unable to resist the seduction of the serpent. The reason for this, perhaps Augustine is not dogmatic here, is that the image of God is not directly attributable to Eve on her own, but only indirectly and secondarily via Adam, and he appeals to 1 Corinthians 11 for this. 
So she was not up to resistance on her own and cannot ultimately be blamed. Adam, in turn, however, falls not because he is sexually seduced by Eve, since until after he has fallen, sexual temptation is not a problem for him, although it becomes an overwhelming problem afterwards. Rather, he does what Eve asks because, I love this bit, he did not wish to make her unhappy. <laughs> just as Augustine notes, we too can offend God just to keep the attachment and affection of friends. Adam's primary problem then, when confronted by God as to his disobedience, is not at this point concupiscence, but pride. He blames Eve instead of acknowledging in humility his own complicity in sin. Now, where Augustine does, of course, most markedly diverge, not only from Nissen, but from the majority Eastern tradition, is in his rendition of the Greek of Romans 5.12. Adam, in whom, in quo, all sinned. And here, notoriously, he misunderstands the Greek ho as a result of which. And his theory thereby of the inherited and indeed sexually transmitted effects of Adam's original sin results a position intensified towards the end of his career by the effects of the Pelagian controversy. The fall becomes then for Augustine a literal event which inexorably and biologically changes the course of human history. Freedom is radically and inexorably and universally undermined by the cacophony of internal compulsions towards concupiscence and libido canalis. The human will has no power of freedom to resist such evils except and unless it freely accepts the offer of divine grace. And the only freedom on offer is paradoxically a complete submission to the workings of that grace. At first blush then, what the comparison of Gregory of Nyssa and Augustine on the fall illustrates is how radically divergent two interpretations of the densely complex yet compelling Genesis narrative can be on issues of gender and sexuality, on the identification of the prime sin, envy or pride, on the question of how original sin is transmitted. For Gregory, as a Platonist, sin is merely a perennial problem for the human rather than a sexually transmitted disease. And above all, on the nature and extent of human freedom, Gregory and Augustine are, in response to these conundra, seemingly poles apart. And yet, underlyingly, there is a most interesting congruence between them, and it is in the realm of the fundamental role of desire in the face of sin, not only in the fall itself, but in the further grace-filled outworkings of the Christian life post-salvation. For both Gregory and Augustine have rich and complex understandings of such desire as we've now seen. Both read desire as ambiguous, labile, open both to corruption, especially sexual corruption in Augustine's case, and to the interruptive propulsions of divine grace, as the Christian continues to stand in that inexorable tension that Paul so vividly describes in Romans 7. But neither Gregory nor Augustine ever solves the fundamental mystery of the fall. That is, neither can ultimately explain the primal sin. And of this mystery, both men become vividly clearer, as we've seen, towards the end of their lives. As Jesse Kuvenhaven concludes in a fine survey article on Augustine or sin in the new T&T companion to the doctrine of sin, I quote, Augustine famously found the primal sin inexplicable, just as Gregory before him manifestly had. For all their philosophical and, and interpretive ingenuity and insight, certain of the original impossible contradictions inherent in the biblical narrative that is, the very emergence of sin and evil in a world created by a good, loving, all-knowing, and all-powerful God. And moreover, through the seductive exercise of a serpent also created by this same God, remained. Further, as I've now demonstrated, Nissen did not moderate this problem by any appeal to a, mod a modern, incompatibilist view of freedom. Both men, though again differently, saw human freedom as sustained within the matrix of divine grace. It might thus seem hugely paradoxical, at least to the modern analytic philosophical mind, to argue that the contradictions of the Genesis fall narrative are best resolved by a divine providential compatibilism rather than a human incompatibilism. But that is the idea that I'm now going to presume and defend in my last section 
and which I presume will go down better in these circles at Wycliffe than it might in some other circles. So I'm going to do it more from the presumption of Thomas and the scholastic traditions um, of the compatibility of divine a temporal providence and individual human choices. So I'm now going to move into my last section. I'm sorry I've slightly overrun my time, but I hope you want to hear how I'm going to solve all this very briefly. You can, I can leave it there if you like. Um, and what I'm going to do here is something a bit odd. I don't think anyone's done it before. I'm going to take a bit of the East Syrian tradition that I presented to you, and I'm going to weave it together with a bit of Anselm of Canterbury that has been a bit neglected. Right, one proposed solution. Anselm's on the fall of the devil as a test case for the education of desire. We come back here too, of course, to the other connected and underlying problem that beset all renditions of Genesis 3, both Jewish and Christian, from the outset. How was evil already present in the form of the serpent at the start of this story? As mentioned earlier, already from the time of origin, Christians solved this by appeal to a meta-story, that of the fall of the angels prior to the story of the fall in Genesis. That, of course, only replicated the aporia of Genesis 3 at a higher level. But Anselm was not an, an exception in following this tradition, yet he probed, I think, further than others had, and further than even Aquinas would later into the mystery of what this proto-fall might mean. Anselm in this little text clearly wants to give as clear an account as possible about how evil came into the world in the first place and how the fall of the devil, backing up one level from Genesis 3, is ultimately responsible for this and gives us the blueprint of how sin subsequently exercises its power. However, he also takes it as read with the majority classic tradition, both East and West, that evil is insubstantial, not unreal, but insubstantial in comparison with good. He thus has to explain, in a characteristic dialogue between a teacher and a student, why an angel would make a bad choice in the first place. The argument from sections 11 to 14 runs thus and attempts to probe this mystery in a way that perhaps echoes, but in a considerably more philosophic and incisive mode, the earlier pedagogic suggestions of Theodore of Mopsiestia in the East. First, Anselm repeats his conviction, quote, that evil and nothing can be shown from their names to be a something, but only a quasi-something. That is, they're insubstantial. And then, that the angel cannot have its first act of willing from itself. And moreover, if it had only the will for happiness, it could neither will anything else, nor not will it, and the will, whatever it willed, would be neither just nor unjust. And it would be the same if the angel were given only the will for rectitude. It, it is because it was given both that it can be just and happy. So it has to be given the possibility of willing the bad. It follows, section 18, that the bad angel makes himself bad and the good angel makes himself good. And that the bad angel owes thanks to God for the goods he received and abandoned, just as the good angel does who retained what he received. Paradoxical as this may seem, therefore, Anselm concludes, section 28, that the power to will what is unfitting was always itself good, and willing itself is good insofar as it exists. So if we're to have choice, it is good that we can choose the bad. What are we to make of this? We are perilously close, you might think, to Gregory of Nyssa's bemused insight that good and evil somehow converge, or perhaps more radically to Julian of Norwich's much later mystical insight that sin is somehow behovely if it fits in ultimately with the good providential intentions of God. For what Anselm seemingly wants to insist upon, and it is crucial to his own theodicy, is that God wants both angels and human creatures to be as close imitators of the divine nature as is possible for their appropriate status. And one central dimension of this must be the capacity to make real but compatibilist moral choices the very fruit of the tree of the discernment of good and evil as such. 
So God gives the angels genuine moral choices according to this compatibilist model within the orbit of his timeless divine providence, as he does too later to Adam. And along with that go all the desires and dispositions appropriate for making such a choice, the desire for justice and happiness, for instance, as well as the precious ascetic gift of perseverance. Without the possibility of that choice, however, Anselm argues, neither angels nor humans are genuinely themselves in God. That is both the risk and the moral dilemma. Without this potential for disaster, even as still caught in the providential workings of the divine note, something absolutely crucial is lost, the capacity for genuine moral agency. God remains good, however, even in presenting this choice, for evil is ultimately insubstantial, and the good of the pedagogic training of desire outweighs the evil of the potential for the corruption of it. So this whole model assumes a meta-ethic in which um, uh, an ethic of virtue is taken as the best choice in theological ethics, rather than um, a meta-ethic of divine command or deontology. And that's where the divergence comes here. It might be objected, of course, that Anselm has merely recreated the same irreducible paradox of freedom, desire, and divine providence as is already present in the Genesis narrative itself, and thereby taken us around in a fruitless circle. But this, I think, is not quite right. Not only does Anselm's assumed metaphysical scaffolding ensure that insubstantial evil will in no wise ultimately triumph, least of all on account of the salvific workings of the incarnation and its logic, about which, of course, he argues famously elsewhere in his Cor Deus Homo. But his compatibilist understanding of angelic and human freedom also keeps even our bad choices ultimately within the divine providential purview. As Brown Davis and Gillian Evans put it in their introduction to this highly original text, focusing again on the crucial issue of desire as rendered by Anselm, I quote, Anselm argues that what Satan did wrong was to desire something to be like God, which was in itself a good thing, but which he wanted to a degree not possible for his created nature, high though it was. So his fault had to do with wanting something good, but in the wrong way or to a false degree, a breach of what Anselm calls the rectus ordo, the right order. The ambiguity of desire and will, then, lies at the heart even of this final theodicy account, but the resolution, even within a remaining mystery in relation to divine providence, how God allows evil choices, insists on the final goodness of God's permission to angelic and human sin. Let me just conclude in a few words. Let me now sum up very briefly what I've argued in this paper, admittedly a complex one, and just indicate how some recent new stirrings in analytic philosophy suggest that our theological debate on this topic of sin have fresh cultural actuality or relevance in the contemporary secular sphere of philosophy. First, I argued that the irreducible paradoxes of the Genesis 3 story are an essential part of its power and should not be diffused too quickly, as some analytic philosophers of religion have notably attempted to do. To stay first with these impossible contradictions is precisely the name of the philosophical and theological game, and we need to go through that. We need to be goaded and intrigued and bothered about this text. Secondly, I showed by a rough threefold typology of classic theological attention to these paradoxes that the Christian, and also behind that the Jewish traditions, have evidenced no one univocal response to Genesis 3, but a pluriformity of insights that should also continue to exercise us dialectically, both philosophically and theologically. Finally, by suggesting a certain amalgam of insights from these different strands of tradition, and by keeping focused on the centrality of the problem of desire and freedom, I have proposed a reconsideration of a neglected text of Anselm's, which I think goes some way not to dissolve the ultimate mystery of divine providence in the face of evil, which of will always remain, but to probe the significance of an ascetic testing of desire according to what Anselm calls 
the rectus ordo, the right order. This, I have argued, creatively constitutes a second account of a Felix Cooper in the fall. <laughs> That's one of the happy faults, along with, of course, the one that resolves it, the incarnation itself. So it's a double Felix Cooper. In closing, just let me note by way of a coda for those of you who are interested, that in the ongoing contemporary analytic philosophical debates about the nature of intentionality, freedom, and responsibility, some new voices are currently being heard which precisely return us to the problem of desire, a topic long neglected in analytic circles. Whether it be Talbot Brewer's at uh, UVA, incisive challenging of what he calls the three dogmas of desire according to a merely propositional account of desire significance, or John Hyman's very different and indeed Herculean rendition of the fall as an ascent into freedom. The classic theological deposit of reflection on the nexus of desire, reason, and freedom in the fall is seemingly surprisingly back in vogue philosophically, even for those who are not Christians. So I think it's time for analytic theologians, and indeed for all theologians, to stretch our muscles further and to engage fully with these interesting new philosophical developments. What they witness to, after all, is the ineradicable significance in Western culture of the myth of the fall and its mysterious and disputable account of the nature of human sin in relation to desire and divine providence. To continue to probe this mystery, I predict, will remain a central responsibility of all theologians in crucial ongoing debate with secular philosophy, classical theological resources, and our pluralist culture. Thank you.